This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. Bowling Alone author Robert Putnam has a new book out in which he talks about two very separate American worlds, the rich world and the poor world. With the president's immigration program held up in the courts, Latina activist Eileen Truax tells us who the dreamers are and why they're so important. And Bill Press talks with USA Today's Susan Page. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Harvard professor and best-selling author Robert Putnam says Democrats dropped the ball a long time ago by refusing to recognize that family structure and class, not race, was the main determinant of poverty. And we say hello to Robert Putnam, professor of public policy at Harvard, author of 14 books, including the groundbreaking Bowling Alone, which popularized the idea of social capital. His latest book, Our Kids, the American Dream in Crisis. Professor Robert Putnam, thanks for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. It's great to be with you. And, and great having you with us as well. You know, your new book traces the lives of individuals uh, from your hometown of Port Clinton, Ohio, to portray the national tragedy of widening class divisions in America and what you call the crisis of the American dream. What caused us to have a generation that is doing worse than its parents? Well, I'd say there are three or four big changes that have led to this predicament in which increasingly how well a child does in life depends upon not their own um, talents and hard work, but on what, whatever their parents happen to do or not to do. Here are the three or four big, event, big trends that are in the background. First and most important and most obvious is the growing income gap in America. That is the gap between rich folks and poor folks, and is, as is very well known nowadays, that gap has grown a lot over the last 30 years, so we now have um, some people up the top of the income hierarchy who are getting a ton of money and large numbers of people uh, in what we used to call the working class who haven't had a raise for, for 30 years. So that's the first big change. Um, the second is, in some sense, in part, a consequence of that income gap that I've just described, which is the collapse of the working class family. Um, one thing that's happened over the last 30 years is that um, family stability, having two parents, among um, people in the upper part of the income hierarchy, I mean the upper third, college-educated Americans, there's been no change. Indeed, work, I mean middle-class people, people with a college education, are kids growing up in that kind of a home are actually now more likely to have two parents than they used to be. But at the bottom, in the bottom third, the high school educated part of America, um, there's been a dramatic change. So now about nearly two thirds of all kids who are growing up with high school educated parents are growing up in a single parent family. And that collapse of the working class family is due to a number. It's not just a single cause, but the most important is the um, is the income uh, gap that it's opened up so that these people are living in much more precarious economic circumstances. Um, I'd say another big part, another big change, again related to the first, but it's not identical, is that America is a more segregated society now, in, in, not in racial or, or religious terms. We're actually less segregated in, in racial and religious terms than we were a half century ago, but we're more segregated in class terms. That is, um, we are less likely, we're more likely to live with other people just like us. Whether we're rich or whether we're poor, we're more likely to live with other people who are either rich or poor. There's less, uh, you know, we're less likely to have neighbors who have a, come from a different background. We're less likely to go to school with people from a different economic background. And we're, we're less likely to marry people from a different um, uh, economic background. We're more, interracial, relig, uh, interracial marriage is up, interreligious marriage is up, up but interclass marriage is down. And so that captures the fact that increasingly Americans are frankly living in two separate worlds, the rich world and the poor world. And and that's an important part. That has big effects on the kids. It means the kids go to different schools. Rich kids go to school with rich kids. Poor kids go to school with poor kids. 
um, it it has it means among other things that even well-meaning people who are you know well off just have no idea nowadays what the poor kids are the lives of poor kids is like. Um, and then I guess finally the other the the final change I would I would call attention to is in a way something of a cultural change. It harkens back to stuff I talked about in Bowling Alone. When I was growing up in in Port Clinton. When my parents talked about our kids, we've got to do stuff for our kids. We've got to have a, you know, pay taxes higher so we can have a new swimming pool at high school or whatever. They did not, by the term our kids, they did not mean my sister and me. They meant all the kids in town. Um, but over the course of the last half century, our notion of we, our sense of responsibility to other people has shriveled. So now when people talk about our kids, they mean my biological kids. And if you talk to poor kids a generation ago, even relatively well-off people in Port Clinton thought of the poor kids in town as part of our kids. But if you talk to people in Port Clinton now about poor kids in Port Clinton now, they don't think of them as one of our kids. They think that's somebody else's kid. Let them worry about them. Mm -hmm. And that big cultural change is what's embodied in the title of the book, Our Kids. I'm, I'm trying to say these are all our kids, and we both we have an economic interest in helping all the kids to do well, but we also have a moral interest in that. Do you think progressives dropped the ball by, by ignoring Daniel Patrick Moynihan's controversial findings of two generations ago now about the, the dissolution of the, the black family? I do, actually. Um, it turns out that it wasn't actually about race. It was about economics. And, and that same, the same phenomenon which hit blacks earlier because they were at the bottom of the income hierarchy, then, you know, 20 years later began to hit whites. It wasn't about race so much. It was about poverty and what poverty does to family bonds. And by um, not just ignoring um, Pat Moynihan's findings, but, but denigrating his findings, dismissing his findings, we liberals, I think, kept ourselves from seeing one of the most important consequences of economic change, which is it was also undermining the family, and the family is really important. We should not be dismissive about the family. Being supportive of family values shouldn't be a monopoly of the right. It should be something people on the left also worry about. That is, family values meaning it's easier to raise a kid with two people in the household. And, 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 and I guess even to be even more moral about it, if you're going to have kids, you've got to be prepared to – I mean, as if you're going to produce kids, you've got to be prepared to take care of them. And I think that's an important factor that – maybe liberals haven't mentioned enough. We're speaking with Robert Putnam, professor of public policy at Harvard, uh, author of multiple books, his latest, Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis. Uh, is the trend toward more social stratification a problem that capitalism can solve, or is it inevitable under the economic conditions that have taken hold in the past 30 years? Well, let me actually, can I say just one more thing about the issue of the family? Because oh, I, I want to make sure that I've, I've clarified what I said, what I meant, meant to say. It's too easy, and this is a natural um, uh, misunderstanding in our culture, to think of what I was saying about the importance of family values as saying I'm blaming the moms, the single moms, for this problem. And I'm absolutely not. If I'm blaming anybody, it's the dads who, who walk away from, from their biological children. This is not the problem of the growing income gap and the growing opportunity gap is a serious problem which does involve the family, but it was not caused by poor women. I, that's the important point I want to make. Now, about the, the uh, capitalism and these, uh, this, these facts. Well, look, I, I'm, not, I'm not all that ideological. I mean, the poor Clinton in the 1950s, which had, was a decent approximation to the American dream, actually, at least in class terms. I don't mean in racial or gender terms, but in class terms, it wasn't. It was a capitalist. I mean, you know, America was capitalist in in 1930 and 1950 and 1960 and 2010. It's not capitalism per se, meaning the ownership of who owns the means of production. But it was certainly true that um, economic conditions are a huge factor in causing the collapse of the, of the middle class. And actually, also, government policies have, have contributed to that. I mean, it was not just an accident that labor unions began to decline. The, the Reagan um, policies toward labor unions contributed to that, no doubt. Um, it's not just an accident that rich folks have much higher incomes now than rich folks under capitalism had in the 1950s. That was a consequence of government policies, government policies chosen by voters. It wasn't that 
you know, God foisted Reagan on us. Americans chose that set of policies, but that set of policies in turn has has fostered this growing um, division among classes. Now, staying on politics for a moment, what do you make of Republican leaders suddenly acknowledging the income gap as a problem? Is it pure politics or a chance for true bipartisanship? Well, I guess I would say both. Um, um, look, the reality, the reality of the growing income gap, the income gap is just nobody can deny that. That's a big deal. And, and obviously, um, there's a limit to how much any politician can, can, can deny reality. Um, but the but the part of that that is that is most uh, distressing to Republicans and actually is also distressing to me is not just the pure income gap, but it's also this opportunity gap. Because, um, as I've said many times before, Americans care about equality of income, but they really care about equality of opportunity. And so, I uh, guess to tell you a brief story um, and do a little name dropping, um, I spent. I've spent quite a bit of time talking to the current president about these issues, Obama, but I also spent, surprisingly, some time talking to his predecessor, George W. Bush, because he'd invited me to the White House to talk about something else, and then I thought, well, why don't I tell him about this opportunity gap? And, I, you know, I wasn't sure whether a Republican, conservative Republican would even listen to me, but he ended up keeping me there for a half an hour unscheduled, and the question is, why did he do that? that this is the question I want to ask you. Why did George W. Bush keep me a well-known liberal Democrat, for an extra half hour talking about the, the opportunity gap. It wasn't because I was a campaign contributor. It's not because I'm a longtime supporter. It's not because I've got a pretty face. It's because what I was telling him, namely this growing opportunity gap, was so, so inconsistent with the core American value of equal opportunity that he couldn't walk away. He in recognized instantly that if what I was saying was true, it was something that he had to be worried about. And so I'm now back to your question. I think part of the reason that Republicans are increasingly concerned this year, actually most Republican candidates are running on, on inequality of opportunity and poverty. And you have to ask, why is that? And partly it's because of the reality. It's partly because they realize now that, that this issue of unequal opportunity is so contrary to the American core values, they can't be caught on the wrong side of it. Does this mean there's also an opportunity for bipartisanship? Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, we have a very polarized, we live in a very polarized world, and, 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 and maybe we'll spend all the time now agreeing that it's a problem, but fighting desperately about who's to blame. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, argument has an important role in democracy, no doubt about it, but in a somewhat saner world, we would also begin thinking about how do we actually solve this problem of poor kids. And I think, in principle, it's a purple problem in which both sides could make a contribution to solving it. That's kind of what my hope is, that it'll become a problem that is so central to our American life and constitution and, and, and norms that you know, different solutions will be tried in different places, and some will work, and, and, and we'll be off to figuring out how to solve it. It could be that won't happen. It could be it'll be become yet one more political football, arguing who's to blame for this, and that would be, from my point of view, the losers in that scenario would be not the Republicans, not the Democrats, but the kids. And you and I can hope together that that's not the case. Robert Putnam, professor of public policy at Harvard, author of multiple books, books, his latest, Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis. Bob, thank you so much again for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. We do look forward to having you back again soon. Thanks very much. I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. 
Latina journalist Eileen Truax says immigration policy, now held up by a federal court, is a human rights issue, not a border security issue. We'll talk to her about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Words can be discombobulating when people twist them to fit concepts that are the exact opposite of what the word actually means. Consider the current debate in Washington over the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This secretly negotiated deal is the exact opposite of a, quote, liberal reform, for it blatantly transfers a major portion of our people's democratic sovereignty into the plutocratic hands of multinational corporate giants. Yet lawmakers and pundits fronting for the corporations have disingenuously dubbed this corporatization of power a, quote, liberalization of global policies. I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. For an example of the reactionary reality of TPP, look at a couple of little favors it does for Big Pharma. First, it extends the number of years that a pharmaceutical giant can keep a patent on its brand-name drugs. Not only does this artificially add more monopoly profits into the coffers of drug makers, but it simultaneously postpones competition from the makers of cheaper generic drugs, an especially dangerous delay for low-income people who are ill. A second provision restricts public regulation of drug prices by any of the 12 countries that are part of the agreement. This is a gross nullification of the people's sovereign right to remedy price gouging by corporate profiteers that hold monopolies on life-saving medicines. Those pushing TPP assert that it's merely a trade agreement, and we should not bother our little heads with worry about its details. But it's filled with gotchas like these gifts to Big Pharma. They have nothing to do with trade and everything to do with global elites secretively, deceitfully, and immorally agreeing among themselves to steal power from us. This is Jim Hightower saying, don't just worry about TPP, fight it. Get the lowdown on how at stoptpp.org. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Eileen Truax is a Latina journalist and activist who has written about the Dreamers. With President Obama's immigration policy under attack in the courts, she says many immigrants come to America not just for economic reasons, but to escape violence in their home countries. And we say hello to Eileen Truax, journalist, uh, originally from Mexico, currently living in Los Angeles. Eileen is also the author of a new book called Dreamers, An Immigrant Generation's Fight for Their American Dream. Eileen Truax, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you very much for having me. Well, it's our pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, Right off the bat, how many undocumented workers are there in the United States, and who are the dreamers? Well, as you know, it's not very easy to make an exact, uh, to give an exact number about undocumented workers, but the estimates uh, currently are in about say, 6.5 and 7 million um, uh, out of the 11.5 million of undocumented uh, people in the country, around 7 million uh, would be undocumented workers. And uh, besides those, two more million would be dreamers. Who are the dreamers? Uh, the dreamers are these um, young people that came to the country with no documents. They were brought by their parents. Uh, many of them, would, when they were very young, maybe two, three years old, uh, they came with their families. They started living in the U.S. And while well, they had to go through the process of adaptation to a new country and a new society, but many of the children did it uh, in a very fast way. They're uh, fast learners. So um, they start going to school, they start learning English, and they start uh, living a life like any other American kid in the country. They um, just 
share the same cultural references with uh, their peers in school. They watch the same TV shows. They have they learn uh, English and they learn about American history and they start feeling this country like theirs. Uh, as you know. Um, Children in, in our country are allowed to go to school from uh, K-12 because uh, every child in the country uh, has the right to go to school and receive education regardless of their immigration status. So they don't have a problem uh, going there and they go to school, they graduate, but it's after graduation when many of them discover that they're not allowed to keep going. Um, pursuing a better future because they don't have documents. And they may have these while they are growing up. Uh, maybe the subject is out there in the family and they talk about it sometimes. Sometimes they don't. Uh, but it's only when they're trying to do something else with their lives after graduating for, from high school when they realize they cannot. Uh, we normally say to our children, if you study hard, you can be whatever you want to. And many of them do study hard. And when they are in the point where they have to decide if they're going to college, if they're getting a job, if maybe they're buying a car, they discover that they can't, and they can't, and they can't, because yeah. they don't have a social security number, and uh, they they cannot do anything that I am um, is the the regular thing for other other children, and well, uh, as you can understand, this can be very frustrating because all of this is result of a decision taken by the family for the reason that they may have at that moment, but they were not uh, part of that decision, and now they're in this situation. It was Ronald Reagan, of course, who signed an amnesty law almost 30 years ago. Why didn't it work? Or, in your view, did it work? Well, uh, I think it was uh, the right thing to do in in that part, in the part of uh, giving a legal status to a group of people that was in this country already uh, contributing and be, being part of the community. What happened is that uh, it was an incomplete uh, measurement. Uh, we have to think about immigration not only as something that is here in home and we have to deal with that. We have to think about the reasons for that uh, immigration to our country. And many of those reasons are related with uh, the, um, the politics of the United States around the country. Um, if we don't address those reasons, uh, especially if the U.S. is largely involved in that, we cannot solve the root of the problem. And I'm going to mention just since uh, since we had that amnesty, we had um, the NAFTA, the new uh, free, uh, free trade agreement with Mexico. Now we have a CAFTA, a free trade agreement with um uh, with uh, with Central American countries, and all of this has had uh, consequences in the local economies in those countries. In the case of Mexico, for example, uh, we have a large amount of Mexican undocumented immigrants uh, coming to the U.S., and many of them are coming after NAFTA because uh, there's no uh, fair trade for producers in Mexico, many of them lost the only way that they had to survive, and now they have to be part of a um, largest group that are looking for other way to survive, just getting into uh, the market job instead of being producers uh, uh, they used to be uh, for generations. Uh, I remember... Um, the testimony that Juan, uh, Jose Antonio Vargas, uh, 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 one of the uh, undocumented young people that had been uh, lobbying in Congress for passing the DREAM Act, uh, when he was giving a testimony, he mentioned this. They asked him, someone in, in Congress during the testimony asked him, why was he here? And um, his response was, we are here because you were there. And sometimes we don't think much about it. Some of the um, the reasons for migration has something to do with the U.S. and um, 
actions that they have performed in some of the, of these countries. Right now, we are having a large amount of people coming from Mexico again, not for economic reasons, uh, but trying to escape uh, from the violence. We have an increase in the amount of people looking for asylum, uh, trying to stay here legally, and they're coming to the U.S. just to save their lives because they have been extorted or their families have been kidnapped or murdered. And uh, sometimes we don't think that many of that is possible right now in Mexico, in the violence way in Mexico since eight years ago, uh, because the arms are going there uh, directly from the U.S. So uh, I'm telling you this just because uh, I think that when we think about amnesty or immigration reform or whatever name we want to give it, we we have to to think about it in a comprehensive way. If we don't address the reasons, it's not likely that we are going to have a permanent solution. How has immigration policy been affected by post-9-11 security concerns? Well, um, clearly a lot. I'll just give you an example. Uh, the DREAM Act, this piece of legislation that would allow uh, DREAMers, these young people that we were talking about before, uh, to stay in the country legally, was uh, first introduced in Congress in August of 2001, and at the moment it had very good chances to be discussed and be approved in a short period of time. Uh, But then, that was in August, then we had 9-11 in September, and every possibility of having that legislation approved went down just uh, with the World Trade Center. We uh, we have seen that the whole focus changed after 9-11, and the problem is that we we keep thinking um, about immigration as something that has something to do with uh, with the border and with the security uh, in the border. Uh, we link one to the other, and here's one example: in the immigration reform bill that was approved uh, in Senate in 2013, and then uh, was stuck in the House. Uh, that immigration uh, reform bill was considering um, to give a regular status to a, around 9 and 10 million people, but only when certain um, security um, measurements were applied successfully in the border. And after that, the immigration um, relief uh, was going to be able to start. The fact that we were linking the the security in the border with the right that these people has to have a regular immigration status, I don't think is the most reasonable thing. We are uh, holding the status of 10 million people, and it's going to depend on how good or not the DHS officials do their work, <laughs> and depending mm. on that, we are going to give them certain uh, rights. So uh, I think uh, we should start switching the way we see that. Uh, This is a human rights um, issue. This is a social justice issue. And we have, of course, to pay attention to the security concerns, but one is not directly a consequence of the other, I think. Eileen, before we let you go, where do you see immigration reform going, both in the short term and the long term? Well, uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think uh, we had a very good chance to pass an immigration reform bill in 2013 that passed. We don't have a chance until we see what happens after 2016. And honestly, uh, we have been these efforts to have the executive action and these efforts to push uh, immigration um, legislative pieces that are going to benefit just a certain amount of people, what is uh, known as a piecemeal. Instead of a comprehensive immigration reform that could benefit the 11 million of undocumented people in the country, we are seeing this 
small pieces of legislation that could benefit certain amount of people. For example, the Dream Act, that if passes, could benefit two million um, uh, young people that came to the country where they were ma- minors. But then we have the Ag Jobs Initiative that would uh, give regular status to certain uh, agricultural workers. And then we have other pieces of legislation, the Tech Jobs Initiative to give uh, also regular status to certain workers, many of them in Silicon Valley, in those areas. So we have these small pieces that may give regular status to 2 million, to 700,000 to maybe 1 million, another comprehensive immigration reform. That's very likely to happen if something happens. Uh, Of course, that would be good from the point of view of certain groups. They say, okay, something's better than nothing. But the truth is that if we think that we are talking about families and we are talking about communities, it's hard to think that the solution is to have just some people in a regular status and other people out of it. You cannot uh, offer a solution for a dreamer, for a, a young person of 18, 19 years old, and uh, keep applying the immigration uh, laws to their parents so one day this uh, young person can go back home and find out that uh, their mother or their father are deported. We have to think in comprehensive solutions that uh, treat fairly the families that are part of our community already. Okay. Eileen Truax, journalist and author of the new book called Dreamers, An Immigrant Generation's Fight for Their American Dream, joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. Eileen, thank you so much for your time with us today. We look forward to having you back on americasdemocrats.org. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. You're quite welcome. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for Stand Up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press and his guest, Susan Page of USA Today. So I'm watching the news last night, Peter, on ABC, and uh, there's a little, a little, little, little tease, a little commercial for Capital Download hey, on Sunday. Right. Very yeah, nice. indeed. I said, oh, I know her. There's <laughs> Susan Page, a Washington bureau chief for USA, at USA Today and co-host of Capital Download, Sundays on 8.30 on WUSA 9. Hello, Susan. Hey, we count on the Bill Press show to provide most of our publicity. <laughs> there you go. Right. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you interviewed Richard Trumka for this week, which I want to talk to you about first of all. But let's start with uh, NSA um, deadline on Sunday. Do you think they're going to make it, Susan, or what's going to happen? I think see no signs are going to make it, do you? I no. Mean, the uh, the administration, the White House, is trying to put on some pressure, saying it's important to get it renewed before it expires uh, on Monday, right, June first. Well, well, yeah, at twelve oh one a.m. Monday morning. Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, he, the White House says it's already winding down the program in expectation that Congress won't act. So, I mean, I guess uh, when was the last time we were surprised that Congress unexpectedly acted quickly? I can't think of when. Well, I can't remember one either, <laughs> and I think it's almost a joke that they're coming. So this expires at midnight. They're coming into session at 4 o'clock on Sunday, giving themselves eight hours, right, to, to, to get something that they've known was going to happen for the last And And, by the way, the House years. is not around. And the, so it, yeah. unless they do exactly what the House did, which is, I suppose, conceivable, uh, it doesn't, you know, the Senate action will not be sufficient to keep the program going. No. And so um, Rand Paul, I, I mean, is the one... It's really one man who blocked the whole thing. right? And it's very consistent with his, you know, we accuse people all the time of a grandstanding when they're running for president, and he he has used this now as a fundraising technique and all that. But the fact is Rand Paul has been pretty consistent about this program from the beginning of his tenure uh, in in the Senate, uh, opposing it, saying it's an overreach, saying it's a violation of uh, Americans' constitutional freedoms. Uh, so, you know, he has stood up on this. 
No, that's right. Um, and uh, it's all consistent with where he's been, as you say, from, from, from the very beginning. Uh, so the other priority, of course, for the, for the administration right now, Susan, is uh, the Trans-Pacific Authority, which is uh, the, the president's authority to make this big trade deal. And I'm sure that's one of the things you talked to Richard Trump about. And labor is against this in a big way. Um, Richard Trumka, the president of the AFL-CIO, said he was a little surprised the Senate passed it last Friday. Um, a couple of senators he mentioned in particular, 13 Democratic senators who sided with the president on that. But he says that they will defeat it in the House. He says they'll keep it down to they'll, the labor lobbying and other forces, will, other opponents will keep the number of House Democrats who support this uh, to 20 or below. And that really puts the pressure on Republicans to stay unified to get it to get it through. And that is going to be tough. That's going to be tough. I mean, John Boehner cannot deliver his entire caucus on this. I thought something like 75 Republicans have said they, they will not vote for it for various reasons. Right? Well, part, partly being that they're now aligned with President Obama, exactly. on this, yeah, which is right. not the traditional. This is really a scrambling of the traditional political Total. positions, right? When you've got Total. the AFLC really ha- taking on a Democratic president. And uh, did you uh, did he talk about, did you ask about some of the, um, I guess maybe threats is not too strong a word that they've <laughs> used against uh, Democrats? You he, vote for this and you're going to pay the price? <laughs> he made those threats. He talked about really? there will be consequences for the 13 mm-hmm. Democratic senators who uh, who backed the back sided with the president on Friday, um, and, and you know they've frozen campaign contributions until this battle is over. That's been a threat uh, hanging over the head of Democratic uh, members of Congress who depend on labor donations and labor enthusiasm. And I'll tell you who else he threatened. Threatened may be too hard a word, but he had pretty a pretty stark warning for Hillary Clinton, who has not made her position on the Pacific Trade Pact clear that she will face less labor enthusiasm if she doesn't take their position on this issue. And, in fact, he said he raised the possibility, although I don't know whether to take this seriously, that the afl might not endorse in a presidential race if they are unhappy with her economic position. Wow. What is this, what was, uh, did you ask him about um, President Obama? Yes, and he expressed, he said President Obama's had a tough hand dealt, a lot of Republican opposition, but he expressed disappointment in President Obama's priorities on things like including the health bill and the failure to include a public option uh, in Obamacare and on other issues. And he said, I only wish that President Obama had fought as hard for our priorities as he had for this trade deal. Wow. Wow. Oh, well, can't wait to see that Sunday morning on Capital Download. Susan Page, always good to have you with us. Thanks so much, Susan. Thanks, Bill. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Robert Putnam, Eileen Truax, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate.